So we are, as I understand it, on uh, Canto 3, Chapter 17, Text 28 and 29. 28 has no purport. So we will collectively recite 29, but I'll just read 28 myself. <clears throat> Tuam lo kapalo dipatir brihachchrava virya paho durma da viramaninam vijitya loke kila daitya dhanavan yajraja suyena puraya jat prabho and the translation to that verse is, You are the guardian of an entire sphere and a ruler of wide fame, having crushed the might of arrogant and conceited warriors and having conquered all the daichas and dhanavas in the world. You once performed a rajasuya sacrifice to the Lord. So I'll recite the... English again. You are the guardian of an entire sphere and a ruler of wide fame, having crushed the might of arrogant and conceited warriors, and having conquered all the daichas and dhanavas in the world. You once performed a Raja Suya sacrifice to the Lord. Okay, so here is <coughs> one of the verse that we will do uh, collectively. Sa eva mupsik tamadena vidvisha. Sa eva mutsik tamadena vidvisha. Dridham pralabdho bhagavan apampati. Dridham pralabdho bhagavan apampati. Rosham samuttama samayan svayadiya. Rosham samuttam samayan svayadiya. Vyavo chadango pasamam gatavayam. Vyavo chadango pasamam gatavayam. Saeva mutsik the Madena vidvisha. Saeva mutsik the Madena vidvisha. Dridham pralabdho Bhagavan a pampati. Dridham pralabdho Bhagavan a pampati. Rosham samutam samayan svayadiya. Rosham samutam samayan svayadiya. Vyavo chadango pasamam gatavayam. Sa eva mutsik the Madena vidvisha. Rudham pralabd ho Bhagavan a pampati. Rosham samuttam samayan svayadiya. Vyavo chadango pasamangatavayam. Sa eva musik the Madena vidvisha. Drudham pralabdho Bhagavan a pampati. Rosham samutang samayam swayadiya. Vyavo chadango pasamam gatavayam. Saham. Varuna. Varuna, evam, evam. thus, thus. utshikta, puffed up, Puff. madena, Dena. with vanity, vanity. Vidvisha. vidvisha, by the enemy, by the enemy. Dridham. dridham, deeply, deeply. pralabdha, mocked, mocked. Bhagavan. Bhagavan, worshipful, worshipful. Apam. apam, of the waters, Patihi, 
the Lord. Rosham, anger. Samutam, sprung up. Shamayan, controlling. Svaya, diya, by his reason. Vyavochat, he replied. Anga, O oh dear one. Upashamam, desisting from warfare. Gataha, gone. Vayam, we. So the translation reads, Thus mocked by an enemy whose vanity knew no bounds, the worshipful lord of the waters waxed angry. But by dint of his reason, he managed to curb the anger that had sprung up in him and replied, O dear one, we have now desisted from warfare, having grown too old for combat. So, responsively, thus mocked by an enemy whose vanity knew no bounds. The worshipful Lord of the waters waxed angry by, by dint of his reason he managed to curb the anger that had sprung up in him. And he replied, O oh dear one, we have now desisted from warfare having grown too old for combat. Sa eva mushikta madena vidvisha jurdham pralabdho bhagavan apampatihi rosham samuttam samayan svayadiya vyavo chadango pasamam gata vayam. Oh. I forgot to read the purport because it's only one. I almost didn't see it. As we see, this is the purport of the uh, verse by Srila Prabhupada. As we see, warmongering materialists always create fighting without reason. So, <clears throat> we've been discussing about the demoniac nature here. Generally, the Vedic literatures tell us about what uh, the divine qualities should be and how to develop them. But there are sections in the Vedas where we find out about demoniac qualities, what they're like, and uh, of course we, are, uh, we understand implicitly that we should avoid them rather than uh, trying to emulate them. And we have been cross-referencing with uh, Bhagavad Gita's 16th chapter, which is a chapter entitled uh, Divine and Demoniac Natures. And mostly, aside from the first verse, the uh, 16th chapter uh, describes the characteristic of demoniac persons. And uh, demoniac nature and demoniac thought and demoniac Action, they have a um, a philosophy. So, uh, people who are demoniac in their way of thinking uh, can explain what they're doing and what their um, purposes are in their mode of thinking through a philosophy. And so it is that philosophies govern the lives of everybody. People may have a very developed philosophy or a person may have a very simplistic philosophy. A person can have a reasonable philosophy or an unreasonable philosophy. A person can have a philosophy that tallies with reality or one that's completely unhinged from reality. All those are possible. Um, and... Um, but the, the fact is that everybody has some kind of philosophy. There's some kind of method behind what they're doing. Uh, in our modern world, for the most part, most people have a very, very um, tiny philosophy. One that really isn't thought out very much. And usually just boils down to a couple of mottos or 
maybe they could be called mission statements or something like that. And it's about the entire sum of their philosophy. There is a uh, writing that was um, done by Bhaktivinoda Thakur called the Tattva Vivek. And um, in it, Bhaktivinoda Thakur uh, gives us an overview of philosophies of planet Earth. And uh, he starts off, interestingly enough, I'll read a little brief section from the very beginning to give him a sense of what this is about. Um, he writes um, verses and then he comments on them. Um, so the first verse that he writes, uh, I'll just read the translation. All glories to Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the nectarian form of everlasting knowledge and spiritual pleasure, by whose mercy this realization of the eternally existing, fully enlightened, blissful supreme has been transcribed. Now this is verse 2. Koham va kim idam vishvam ayo ko nyavyo druvam atmanam nirvrito jiva prachchati jnana siddhaye. What is this universe? This is a translation. What is this universe? Or who am I? What fixed relationship is there between us? In order to find the truth, the conditioned spirit soul, surrounded by matter, asks himself these questions. So it starts off purport. The external world of sense objects is perceived by the senses. The objects are called vishaya. And as the child matures, he becomes more and more aware of them. He becomes attracted to them. He tastes, and because he tastes pleasure in contact with them, as such, he thinks and acts continuously so that he can experience this pleasure. He acts for nothing else. He becomes a constant companion of smell, taste, touch, form, and sound. And his mind thus becomes enslaved by them. When the idea arises, when death comes, I will no longer have any relationship with these external sense objects. When this thought manifests, he is fortunate he turns away from the external world and the sense objects and strongly desires to know the absolute truth. At that time, he asks the above-mentioned three questions. Who am I, the perceiver of this external world? What is this external world? And just what is my relationship to it? So here's the next verse, verse 3. The self, due to variegated nature of his conditioning, gives many, many answers to these questions. The spirit soul, situated in his own original form and nature, indeed presents the true answer. So, um, Bhaktivinoda Thakur gives a long purport to that verse. But um, what he's laying out is that um, to the answer to these three questions, who am I, what is this universe, and what is my relationship, there are, as we see in the world, countless answers to this question. What are, what am I, what is this world, and what is my relationship with it? But Bhaktivinoda Thakur makes two categorical uh, shoots or bins that we can put everything in. One bin is we can put things into the bin of true answers, which is given by a, a soul that is in his constitutional position. And the other is all the other answers that uh, were be given by people who are not in their constitutional position of servant of the Lord um, and their mind enlightened by true knowledge. So then later on, he begins to describe this idea that uh, there are two basic categories of answers. One of them is, he says, you know, uh, he calls it astika. Astika means, is the Sanskrit word for it is so. So astika. Uh, 
answers are Vedic answers, ones that are the, uh, we assume the Vedas to be correct and therefore such answers are called astikam. Now, uh, answers that are by philosophies that um, attack the Vedas are called nastika answers. Not is not so. So, we have two basic categories, Vedic and non-Vedic answers. Uh, then, Bhaktivinoda Thakur begins to uh, talk about um, further you know, uh, distinctions uh, among what he calls uh, materialistic and non-materialistic. So materialism he calls jadavad. Uh, Jada means stone. So it's the um, philosophy of, of the stone. <laughs> jadavad. So um, materialism comes in two flavors. And one of them is um, uh, the flavor called, uh, let me see if I can get to it here. Jadanandavad. And the other flavor is Jadanirvanavad. So, Jadanandavad is people who want to enjoy the material. So, people who claim that uh, from material, from matter, one can get enjoyment are Jadanandavadis. And those who are um, claiming that one has to detach himself completely from material, from matter, are... uh, as he puts it here, uh, jada, jada Nirvanavad, which is basically Buddhism. Uh, jada Nirvanavad puts forward the idea that uh, we cannot enjoy matter, which is kind of um, obvious in one sense, but um, the there is no alternative and no so what's the alternative to not enjoying matter? And according to at least traditional Buddhism, at least some as- some flavors of traditional Buddhism, it's that uh, one has to realize that you don't exist. So the answer to the three questions, what is this universe, who am I, and what is my relationship, is that you don't exist, the universe really doesn't exist. And uh, there, there is no relationship. <laughs> so this is Jada Nirvanavad. So um, the idea is to make everything zero. And that's why Prabhupada's uh, Pranam Mantra says Nirvishesha Shunyavad. So Shunya is zero. So there are those who believe that um, everything is zero. And... Um, then we have the Jadanandavadis, those people who are in love with matter and that believe that one can enjoy matter. And this is primarily most of the philosophies on the uh, planet. And um, people who are demoniac, um, we have... Um, in the um, 16th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, we have this idea that uh, they are prideful, arrogant, deceitful, conceited. Um, they have the desire to um, put other people down because the main function of a person who is uh, demoniac is to subjugate everybody else, to impress my will on everybody else's will. And this is the business of uh, demoniac people. And this is exactly what um, our uh, Hiranyaksha is doing. So he's come into contact with Varuna. Varuna is a very uh, exalted demigod. He's the uh, god of the waters. So Varuna has been approached by uh, Hiranyaksha. And Hiranyaksha has glorified 
um, Varuna, but in a sarcastic way. So it's, it's, um, he's saying all these wonderful things about him, and his real intent is to anger Varuna so that, uh, that Varuna will fight him. But of course, the demigods are already cued in to the fact that Hiranyaksha is undefeatable, as his brother is, uh, Hiranyakashipu, and that the only way that they will be defeated is by the Supreme Lord. So this is what uh, Varuna will do, is just to suggest that uh, as soon as possible, Hiranyaksha um, come in contact with the Supreme Lord, and the Supreme Lord will remove his pride and his life at the same time. So that, that's the uh, uh, information that uh, Varuna gives. Of course, Varuna also says that I am too old to fight. So he disqualifies himself. And it's interesting here that we find that uh, Varuna manages to control the anger that comes up by being challenged in this impudent way by this uh, demon here in Yaksha. And this is the nature of those who are saintly, is that even when they can be provoked or they're being provoked by somebody, they're able to control themselves. So this is what Varuna has done. In understanding philosophies, we, reckon, we recognize that um, materialism is actually two different things that are related but not exactly the same thing. Um, from a philosophical point of view, from Western philosophy, materialism <laughs> means that one believes that matter is all there is. That's one definition of materialism. And that's usually what is meant in Western philosophical circles when you say materialism. It means that one believes that matter is all there is. So um, um, in Western philosophy, there's the idea of monism. Prabhupada uses that word a lot. Monism means that there's one substance. What is that substance? It's either spirit or matter. And then if it's spirit, that means matter is a type of spirit. And if it's spirit, I mean, if it's matter, then it means uh, spirit must be a type of matter. So you know, that's what monism is. That's opposed to dualism, where you think there are two substances. <clears throat> so at any rate, um, this idea of materialism means that um, matter is ultimately the ground of everything. And any explanation must eventually wind up discussing how matter is formed to create whatever it is that we're discussing. But... Um, uh, we understand that this is not a fact, that matter is not the ground of everything. The ground of everything is actually spirit. So in that sense, from a Western philosophical point of view, we are what would be called idealists. Uh, but it's more subtle than that, really. We're not really idealists. We understand that everything is formed from Krishna's energy, parasya shakti or vividaya shriyate. Everything is coming from some kind of uh, energy of Krishna. We have the internal energy, which is Krishna's, um, you know, uh, Antaranga Shakti, we have the external energy, which is his Bahiranga Shakti, and we have the marginal energy, Tatasta Shakti, which is you and I. We are the Tatasta Shakti, or marginal energy. So um, that's how we understand it from a Vedic point of view. Now, back to the concept of materialism. Materialism has a second meaning, and usually it goes very well with the first meaning, and materialism means that matter is the goal of everything, that enjoying matter is what life is all about. And that is 
in harmony with what Bhaktivinoda Thakur calls Jadananda So Jadananda means one appreciates matter as being the real purpose or the goal of everything, that enjoying matter is how we will enjoy. And as he says, the child grows up, you know, from being a baby and realizes that their sense objects, he enjoys those sense objects, and from understanding how his parents and his peers and everybody in the world is acting, the child learns that enjoying these sense objects is basically what life is about. And uh, there is no contradicting philosophy that he ever comes across, generally speaking, unless he meets one of those guys on the street, you know, chants Hari Bowl and hands him a book and asks him for a donation, you know, guys or girls that are <laughs> on the street. So uh, that's the only way that he would have any clue that there's something other than um, the senses and the sense objects and we're supposed to enjoy them. <coughs> Uh, this is, um, of course, why people who are materialists will always um, come to some horrible situation. Because a as we learn in the um, 16th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, that, uh, let me, okay, 16, there we go. They believe that to gratify the senses is the prime necessity of human civilization. Thus, until the end of their, thus until the end of life, their anxiety is immeasurable, bound by a network of hundreds of thousands of desires and absorbed in lust and anger. They secure money by illegal means for sense gratification. So, anyone who is basing their lives on material sense gratification is going to be absorbed in lust and anger because whenever you make the senses the goal of your life, then collecting sense impressions is your main business and you will be in competition with other people who are also collecting sense perceptions, you know, we want so many different kinds, like the uh, Pokemon craze or something like that. We want, yeah, got to get them all, you know. So <laughs> we are, uh, so we are trying to see which possible version of sense gratification we haven't gotten, and if somebody else gets it before we do, we might have to wait, or we might have to lose out. So we're in competition. And uh, somewhere along the line, we get the smoking more but enjoying it less principle kicks in, you know, that the more we uh, try to enjoy a particular kind of sense gratification, we realize that it takes more to get to the same point, and eventually we start to realize that one category of sense gratification no longer cuts it for us. It's no longer... The big, you know, rock 'em, sock 'em, you know, knock your socks off kind of thing that it once was for us. So we move on. And usually we move on to darker forms of sense gratification, because that's the way the material world is set up to move us on into darker forms of sense gratification. And um, this is unfortunate because this is how people lose their lives in the sense of wasting their lives. Um, and there are a number of ways. Usually, I think there are some big favorites uh, of ways people destroy their life. And uh, probably uh, intoxication is a good way to really destroy your life. Um, one discovers that uh, nothing really makes me that happy, but when I'm intoxicated, I'm sort of, I don't care anymore. So uh, intoxication is one way that a person goes down one particular rat hole into a life that's completely destroyed. 
Another one is um, by unfortunate romantic relationships. There's another way that people generally can go down a rat hole into a life that's not worth living. Of course, there are people like, for instance, our uh, Hiranyaksha, who want to compete in be able to conquer everybody. So through this competition and warfare, people, um, usually at some point along the line, they meet somebody that's bigger than they are and uh, their life gets ruined that way. So through competition and uh, warfare, one's life is ruined. Um, And... What else is there? Of course, sex life is, um, you know, one of the the most important ways people can ruin their lives by engaging in uh, unrestricted sex life, which always tangles people up into very unfortunate, humiliating, and degrading uh, situations. So these are like booby traps hidden just inches underneath the soil Uh, for the unwary traveler of the material nature to kick up and blow their foot off, you know. So this is what, um, what happens to people because all they know is matter. They are, um, as we we're talking about Jadananda Vadis, they are uh, um, thinking that by enjoying matter, I will enjoy. And they've never heard any other philosophy And so, therefore, they're in one of these modes. Usually, people who are very serious about material sense gratification, then they are competing with others and like here in Yaksha. What they want to do is to uh, get sense gratification and uh, to subjugate everybody else in the process of getting their own sense gratification. So... Bhaktivinoda Thakur goes on in Tattva Vivek where he describes two forms of Jadanandavad, of, um, you know, uh, thinking that material sense gratification is the goal of life. One of them he calls Nirsvarta Jadanandavad and the other one is Svarta Jadanandavad. So, um, Svarta Jadanandavad means to want sense gratification, and you don't care what it does to or for anybody else. So that's the people who are totally sold out to sense gratification. Near Svarta Janandabad. This is all talking about What's that? This is different. Yeah, these are described in time. It's all described in Tatva Vivek. It's an interesting book, if you can find a good copy of it. I'm not sure I would recommend this one. This one is a little bit dubious to me. From um, It was um, done by s- someone uh, that I used to know in the um, West Coast uh, by, what's his name here? He compiled it. Uh, what's that? Yeah, it might be a different version. Um, Kailas Chandra, that's the person. Um, and he was kind of uh, kind of a dubious person. <laughs> At any rate, I don't want to get into that. But um, but most of the most of um, the uh, Tattva Vivek is about Bhaktivinoda Thakur discussing Western philosophies and explaining how they stack up. Uh, And, of course, if you um, spend any time looking at Western philosophies, you begin to realize, compared to Vedic philosophy, they really fall flat. Because they really aren't complete philosophies. Um, I'm amazed at how, when you read about Western philosophies, they talk about how complete they are, but... Obviously, they've never really come in contact with Vedic philosophy, or they wouldn't be saying that. But um, there's so many holes missing. And you, you take many of these philosophers, um, some of them just talk about one aspect, you know, like uh, Socrates. Basically, Socrates was just 
talking about morality. That was his main thing. Of course, Christianity, Jesus basically talks about morality. He doesn't really explain logic or he doesn't explain epistemology. He doesn't explain other things. So um, that means when these other sections are missing, then we have to get them from somewhere else, you know. So uh, materialism is always uh, going to leave us flat um, and uh, it's always going to create a uh, group of people who are, as we were talking about last week, uh, interested in unbeneficial, horrible works meant to destroy the world. So that's where we are now, and we can see how this is reaching a crescendo, unbeneficial, horrible works meant to destroy the world. There is a um, media personality named Chris Hedges who made the uh, statement that uh, we are now living in a country where, as he put it, um, the educational system destroys knowledge, Doctors destroy health. Lawyers destroy justice. The government destroys freedom. Religion destroys morality. And uh, the banking system destroys wealth. <laughs> well, no, no, this is, I'm, I'm quoting Chris Hedges here. It sounds like you're quoting the 12th canto. <laughs> it's, it's something similar to that. But uh, what's, what's really interesting about this statement is that the, the uh, group of people whose expertise is supposed to be a particular uh, important thing in our world are destroying the very thing that they're supposed to be, uh, you know, like, like it's saying that lawyers destroy justice. Lawyers are supposed to be the people who are helping create justice, you know, uh, that uh, <clears throat> the educational system destroys knowledge. And educational is supposed to be promoting knowledge, but instead it destroys it. That uh, doctors destroy health, you know, doctors are supposed to be the people who are helping people with their health, but instead they're destroying it. So th this is what's interesting about it. And that uh, kind of sums up Kali Yuga, that uh, uh, all good works are supplanted by false experts who are actually engineering the downfall of the very thing that they're supposed to be culturing. So uh, that's the unfortunate part of uh, Kali Yuga. So there's a lot more I could say, but I'm, I'm going to stop there because I want to give some time for questions and answers. If, yeah, Matunga. Yeah, get the lay uh, microphone. <coughs> I wanted to ask, um, um, there, there is a statement by Prabhupada, I think he was stating that Mayavari is uh, a covered atheism or Buddhism is a covered Mayavari, I think maybe something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, actually, according to the Vedas, anything but recognizing Krishna as a person, as a supreme is... Atheism. <laughs> if you think of the Brahman or you think of, uh, you know, of these other types of, um, you know, concepts, they're all various kinds of atheism. People who believe the universe is God, according to, to the Vedic philosophy, that's a kind of atheism, you know. Most people think that it's uh, a theism. And in one sense, we could call it theism. It's, it's just a matter of terminology. But... Um, um, there's so many different ways to miss the mark, you know, as Bhaktivinoda Thakur is saying, that there's one answer given by the living entity who is in his original constitutional position and a host of answers given by those who are not in their constitutional position. And those 
various other answers are all various flavors of wrong answer, uh, or at least incomplete answers. Some of those answers can have parts of them that are indeed um, correct, but uh, there's something missing or at least some aspects of the answer that are incorrect. So those who think that there is, um, you know, as I say, there is um, those who believe in um, just zero. That's the Buddhist uh, philosophy. Um, And then those who believe that it's all one, which is the um, uh, Mayavad philosophy. And then those who believe it's two which is us, you know, we believe that there is a supreme and a living entity. And we are simultaneously one with and different from the supreme. And the purpose of life is to serve the supreme. And um, that answer, actually, you can base a life around it and you will not go down one of these rat holes that I was just describing, you know, the rat hole of intoxication, the rat hole of, um, you know, um, warfare and competition, the rat hole of, um, you know, uh, bad romance or the rat hole of um, uh, sex life or uh, one of these other kind of things, which is where most people's life goes off the rails and onto the reef, you know, which is uh, like uh, people don't know that they're wandering throughout this world, but there's so many trap doors, so many booby traps, and because they don't have any knowledge, eventually one of those trap doors, one of those booby traps will get them, you know, and uh, that's unfortunate. Other questions? Okay. Um. It appears that um, when we're outside speaking with people, especially trying to to preach to them, uh, that uh, their minds are being influenced by these Western philosophies, Mm -hmm. which come from the days of Socrates and Aristotle and so forth. So many things are there that are basically... um, engraved in the modern uh, Mm -hmm. atheistic uh, culture. So my question is, is it uh, it important for us as preachers to to study these philosophies nicely so that we can uh, defeat them? Well, I don't think it's necessary for everybody to study those philosophies, but um, I think to some extent it's... It really helps me to understand what the shortcomings are of these other philosophies because oftentimes people will argue or present something. And oftentimes um, people in our Western world are unaware of where their ideas are coming from. Um, We just grow up with them, you know, uh, they're out there in the everyday world. And what what that means is that when you say some things, people will accept them without question. And when you say other things, you'll have to fight an uphill battle to uh, get a person to accept that thing, you know. So why is that? And the answer is, of course, that in Western philosophy, Certain things have been kind of generally accepted by people for a long time. And uh, so therefore, if you say them, most people won't, um, you know, make any uh, challenge to it. Um, But most people have never considered the uh, ramifications or the the things that uh, go downstream when you accept some of these things. As I've said, um, I think the first important thing to realize is why is it that philosophy starts with the Greeks? You know, at least wherever, whether you're growing up in, as far as I know, anywhere in the world, you'll study philosophy and it'll start with the Greeks. And the answer to that question, why it starts with the Greeks, is they were the first to present a naturalistic philosophy. 
and I've said, what is naturalism? Naturalism is the opposite of supernaturalism, which is, of course, that um, supernaturalism agrees that there are causative forces that are not matter, that are not uh, what we know of as mundane nature. So at the time of the Greek philosophers, you know, starting with the pre-Socratics like Thales and uh, Heraclitus and uh, Parmenides and these guys, you know, um, during that time, the Greeks were worshiping demigods, just like people in India worship, you know, and the Egyptians were worshiping demigods. But we put all these philosophies in the garbage can as far as Western uh, thinking goes. All of them go in the garbage can. Why? <clears throat> because the Greeks started by assuming that there aren't any demigods, there isn't any god, that there is, we can build things up from fundamental matter. They are jadanandavadis, you know, they are building things up directly from matter and from logical consequences. So that's where Western philosophy starts. And um, once we talk about the Greeks, we go on and on, and people built on it. Of course, there was Christianity, <coughs> which is certainly not a uh, materialistic philosophy. But that's kind of an interlude, you know, uh, Western philosophy goes from the Greeks. We have the Christian era, and then on the other side of it, we have the post-Christian era, which is, you know, all these other people. And that's why we have this atheistic culture that we live in now, because this, you know, post-Christian philosophers did their best to debunk Christianity. And for most people, it worked, you know. And uh, at least people think it worked until you kind of uh, do a little bit of um, investigation. Then you realize uh, that these arguments depend a lot on what you accept as your fundamentals. I've also made the statement that uh, uh, philosophy is kind of like a spectator sport or uh, some kind of... uh, you know, uh, physical sport, you know, you have your um, um, rules of the game. If you're going to play philosophy, you have to have some rules. And then you're going to have your favorite teams and best strategies. And then you're going to have your uh, sports equipment. You know, you're going to need those things. So philosophy is kind of like that. Depends on what the rules of the game are. Um, how the game gets played, you know. So if you're going to talk philosophy, first, the person you're talking with, you have to decide what are the rules of the game, you know. Um, And um, this is why, as Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, there are so many answers to these questions because people have different sets of what are the rules of the game. Uh, In the modern world, the minute you say something that is a supernatural cause there are people who will say well okay we're going to put that away because there are no supernatural causes there's no proof that there's no such thing as supernatural causes but there are certain people who will reject out of hand because you've mentioned a supernatural cause so uh, which is of course the sum and substance of materialism which is the sum and substance of atheism as I said, I, I came up with this acronym for what I think are the uh, very misleading aspects of our modern civilization, the most uh, unfortunate trends, which I call rabid men squared. You know, So R stands for reductionism, A stands for atheism, B stands for behaviorism, I stands for impersonalism, uh, D stands for determinism, and men squared, you have two versions of M, so you've got men is materialism and, and uh, 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 mechanism, E is uh, epiphenomenalism, and uh, um, 
I forgot what the other E is, and N is uh, n uh, numericism and uh, naturalism. So we have, uh, these are the trends of modern thinking and modern philosophy that show that uh, thinking has gone off the rails and into the ditch in some kind of way, you know, so reductionism, uh, we reduce everything to matter. Uh, um, atheism, there's no God. We can't talk about God. We can't talk about any kind of causes other than material causes. Uh, D, determinism, everything is determined by some material laws. So one of the most important features of the uh, philosophy of West is that they believe absolutely in the laws. We don't believe in the laws. We believe in the lawgiver. So we see as primary the lawgiver. So if the lawgiver is primary, that means those laws can be changed. And sometimes they are. But if you believe in the laws, then you have to build a whole philosophy up from only the laws. And the laws can never change because that's all you have. So... If you kind of understand these principles, you can understand why people say what they say, and you can also kind of come up with how to, at least people who are open, not everybody's open, but those that are open, you can figure out how to get them around their particular philosophy, materialistic, atheistic philosophy. All right. Um, so unless someone else has a really pressing question, we're over time, so we should probably end. So thank you all very much for your kind attention. All glories to Srimad Bhagavatam. All glories to the Vaishnava devotees of the Lord. Hare Krishna.